B-rated movies. Well, uh, thank you for being here today. We're here with Casey Tebow, the director of Black Friday, and uh, happy birthday. Hey, How man. are you doing? I'm good. Um, so, uh, so we, we did Black Friday for, uh, an episode cause we were looking at Thanksgiving movies and it's kind of hard to find a good one. Uh, yeah. but this was definitely like a, a step above. Um, uh-huh. but before we get in, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just laughing. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, before we get into that, like, how did you get into, um, like filmmaking, making movies? You know, when I was like in third, fourth grade, it was definitely something that I was like, man, I wonder if I could do that, you know, when I get older. And it was always there, you know, in the back of my mind, that was that was what I wanted to do. But I just never for some reason, when I went to college, I studied, you know, communications, which was the film department at my university in New Haven, Connecticut. Um and when I got out, I stayed in New England and there wasn't at the time, you know, Massachusetts now is really a hotbed for filmmaking because the tax credit is here. So there's tons of movies. This was like back in the day, like all you had was like, you know, blown away with Jeff Bridges uh, and okay. Tommy Lee Jones and maybe a couple other movies. And then like. After Goodwill Hunting, things kind of exploded. And now it's like they shoot everything here, including TV shows. Um, so from like, you know, my biggest downfall, I feel like, and I have zero regrets. I mean, no regrets at all. I definitely started my career later than most because from 20 to like 27, uh, I lived in Boston. I was working as a graphic designer and I have a really big group of friends who I love dearly like brothers. And we spent a lot of time just riding motorcycles and, you know, drinking and, and, and screwing around and having fun and just literally a lot of life experience. And then my late twenties, I was like, man, if I ever want to do this, I really need to like try to do it now before I get too old. And that's when I, I started working with the Aerosmith guys. And, you know, I, I knew that like that opportunity would lead itself to, cause I knew, I, I knew that if I started working with the Aerosmith guys, I would eventually, after a couple of years, get to a point where I was doing things for them. And, and I did. I, I did and a couple maybe. documentaries and music videos. And, and uh, that plan sort of worked out for me, you know, which is what led to Happy Birthday. Oh, okay. Um, so as far as, like, Happy Birthday, that was, like... I, I re- it felt very much like like April Fool's Day, but it didn't have the ending that just leaves you unsatisfied. Right. Which I kind of like watching the movie, not to give too much away, but like um, <clears throat> I, I did feel like something's not right here. Like that every time they could do something to him, they're not doing it. And it's right. like something's weird. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it was such a great touch. Thank you. But yeah, yeah that so was, um, that, was, that was a weird one, man. Right. We, I had done in 2014. I had done a concert film with Aerosmith. We went to Japan during the right after the Fukushima meltdown, and I had sold it to the movie. And I got a, uh, I met a dude at Gersh who was a uh, um, a sales agent by the name of Jay Cohen. He sold the movie, and then he was like, "Well, what do you want to do next?" And I said, "I, I want to do a feature." And I had written a, a pretty intense cop drama, much like oh. Black Rain, the Michael Douglas movie, and um, which ironically I'm trying to do next. Um, he said, "This is great. This is a great script. Uh, I I think we could get this made." He said, "But you know, you got to do something first. That's much much less expensive. You need to do a movie for less than a million bucks." So I sent him the script for happy birthday and he was like, Oh, I, I can get this finance. And we ended up doing it, I think for like 600 grand. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really cool. Um, Thanks, man. I don't know. Problem. Like one of the, the things I really loved about that movie is like in the back of my head, I'm thinking you see Steven Tyler and it's like, okay, it's going to be a celebrity thing, but like his character just fits so well. Like, was that, was he always in your mind to put in the movie? 
No, you know, it's funny. Um, Steven and I had always been close and it was right. You know, we had cast the movie, Matt Bush, who's on the Goldbergs. I met with him and he was in and Eric Palladino, who was in on ER for a while. He, he was cast and Matt Willig, who's now having much success on the, the young rock show playing Andre the Giant. Um, initially, that movie was supposed to be Brittany Olford, who is that really tall, gorgeous. Uh, she's like mixed race. Um, she's from uh, Canada. She plays Lucia. It was supposed to be her and Alexa Vega from the Spy Kids movies. Um, and oh, Alexa, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alexa backed out last minute for like religious reasons or something. So I ended up casting Vanessa Lenji's uh and alexa's husband at the time i think it's her boyfriend at them i think it's her husband now he was oh, initially going to play the steven tyler role it was a much more younger sort of gangster sort of cholo and he was in too i think he was in a boy band or something um and then i remember right around the time that alexa dropped out i called steven uh and i was like hey i'm coming to la for like three months and I'm trying to save money for production. You know, can I stay at your place? He had, he was renting like a four bedroom house from Salma Hayek at the time. And it was not like oh, a, wow. not like a typical LA house. It was just very normal, like family house. It wasn't like some big Hollywood Hills thing. Cause I think he was on the road at the time and he, he goes, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm coming out to do my first narrative movie. And he goes, Oh man, that's great. He goes, um, so you got a role for me. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> uh i was like you know what i i was like yeah i think i could do that so i rewrote that role for him and adam green who um did all the hatchet movies much to adam's credit he came over one day and we were hanging out at steven's house and he was like man you should do some like crazy like drexel from true romance and we just ended up like having fun building this character. And you know, the thing about a guy like Steven, you got to be careful with this. I had seen him in Be Cool with Travolta and Uma Thurman, and he was really bad. He was really bad. I mean, he stopped the movie. It's almost like when you're watching Saving Private Ryan and Ted Danson shows up and you're like, what the fuck is Ted Danson doing in Saving Private Ryan? Yeah. You know, you, you worry that Steven could have that same effect in happy Actually, birthday but then i had seen another really small movie he did i i think i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure it was called goodnight joseph parker and he had this really small role and he played like a trucker or something and he was really good and i was like all right well it's clearly either f gary gray didn't jive with steven or he was nervous being around uma thurman so i was like you know fuck it i'll give him a chance and we put him in happy birthday and he was great and when the movie came out you know, he like, dude, he got us into like Entertainment Weekly and People Magazine and like talk about free press, you know? Oh, and wow. He, yeah. And, and the people at Gersh who were selling the movie were like, man, we're really we were really worried that Steven was going to stop the movie. But he was fantastic. And I think he was fantastic, you know? Oh, yeah, he was great. Like, I love that. Like uh, when I forget the, the name of the main guy, but when he gets away. um Oh, not uh, yet. Brady. Brady. Yeah, Brady. When Brady gets away and he's like, you know, like practically naked on foot and like he meets up with Steven Tyler. Steven Tyler does that whole speech like that really like made the character for me. Yeah. Yep. That's, you know, I have to, I have to go back and think. But um, man, that scene was that was like the first thing we shot the first day because of Steven's schedule. We were on a soundstage in Santa Clarita. And I wanted to do the old Alfred Hitchcock thing. So we like went out and shot a bunch of film and we projected the background on a projector screen behind this truck. It was just so much fun, man. We had such a great time making that movie. Yeah. So, oh yeah, it was, it was really fun. Like even the ending, like, uh, kind of, um, like after everything happens, um, like he he tells him he's basically doing it to like show him he can make a movie. Yeah, and exactly. I love his reaction. Exactly. Like, well, why didn't you just <laughs> right, instead of yeah. torturing me? Why didn't you? Why didn't you right. just give me a movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so funny too because I think a lot of that comes from just it's a lot of that a lot of me. You know, it's so it's so funny because people will be like, I you know, 
um, Edward Ham Jr. is a producer. He produced Donnie Darko and Get Out, and um, he he and Sean. McKittrick I love Donnie Darko. Not, yeah, he and Sean McKittrick, who had had started Darko with Richard Kelly, they produced oh, Happy yeah. Birthday. And uh, Edward Ham, uh, when we did a screening or whatever, he was like man that scene in the strip club is like th- that's like the most realistic drug scene i've ever seen in a movie and i was like well that that's what happened to me in amsterdam everything you see pretty much a lot of what you see in that movie happened to me in amsterdam in like the mid 2000s and a lot of that stuff uh like when the big dude is like throwing up and like you know pooping on the floor at the same time and he's like i'm puping like we i literally witnessed the guy say that that's not made up you know what i mean like <laughs> so much of that movie is just experience from that period of my life from like 20 to 27 where me and my friends were just doing really really dumb stuff and i remember reading some of the early reviews and they were like oh it's just another dumb white guy with a tarantino rip off of a bunch of guys getting messed up in mexico and i was like well yeah but most of this happened like so i don't know what to tell you you know yeah, but a lot of that uh, that drug scene did feel like really realistic, like the craziest, coolest party you can go to. Yes. Uh, like, I, I did enjoy that. It was fun. Uh, thank you so much. Um, oh, no problem. Um, so now with uh, like moving on to Black Friday, um, we watched that. That was uh, super funny, super gory. It had enough story to kind of like tell you who the characters were, but not like overtell, yeah. which was nice for sure. Um, so how did that one all come about? Um, I had done happy birthday. And then in 2018, I did a, a documentary. Steven Tyler went and did a country record and I didn't really want to, ma- I didn't really, really want to make a documentary but I had I've known Steven long enough that when he went to make this country record, I had seen him uh, be the happiest I'd ever seen him. And I'll never forget when the movie came out, it got a lot of great reviews. And some dude who was like working for the New Yorker or whatever called me and was like, I just have to tell you, I'm 55 years old. And I've 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 always dreamed of being a comic book artist and I'm a really good artist and I've been writing all my life. But you your documentary inspired me to start drawing again. And he was like really emotional about it. And um, that's just a little segue about making that movie. So so it was worth it to make the documentary. And then when it came to what I wanted to do next, um, you know, making the, the hardest thing about making a movie is casting. It's like so I have this cop movie gut shot that i wrote uh that the guys at gersh want to do and i had an offer from Redbox. they were going to finance it uh and make it like a red box original and now we're looking at some other financiers and stuff but it's like if you can't go out and get uh you know it's like i did black friday with devin i love devin i think he's an incredible actor so if i want to do gut shot with devin you know i got to go out and i got to get devin but i also got to get like uh somebody like uh tyrese or uh 50 cent you know to play his partner and then to someone for the police commissioner you got to get like a russell crowe or a mel gibson because you have to fill the roster of actors with with talent that these distributors think are going to help them make their money back you know it's, it's it's a business first um so I I was reading scripts, reading scripts, reading scripts, trying to get gut shot made. And then I, I came across came across Black Friday and um, I was like, man, this is really, really fun. And Andy, who was the writer, uh, he was like, well, how do we get this going? And I said, you know, the hardest thing is casting. And um, he was like, well, he goes, I I have some investors I might be able to hire a casting director. And I said, Andy, you know, if you do that, you might lose your money because you pay a top casting director. It's like 25, 30, $40,000, whatever. So he said, well, I think I can get an investor to hire a casting director. And I said, all right, well, we can do that, but it, it, it may not work. So we did. And then I think, uh, I don't know if Bruce was the first person we got. Could have been Devin, could have been Devin Sawa. 
But it was one of those things where like Devin wanted to do it. And then because he wanted to do it, Bruce Campbell was going to read it. And then because Bruce Campbell wanted to do it, the rest of like, and then all of a sudden it was like, well, then we got the rest of the movie finance because of Devin and Bruce and Michael Jai White and Ivana Baccaro uh, and even Ryan Lee to some extent, you know, the cast was pretty stacked. We just ended up getting the movie financed and uh, we shot it at the worst possible time. It was terrible. Uh, we shot it during peak COVID, excuse me, peak COVID before vaccines. And, you know, my one regret <laughs> is I wish that toy store was full of people, but it, it is what it is, you know? Yeah, it didn't really like have the crowd fill of a Black Friday, but it had the, um, how do I put it? Like the, the tension of a Black Friday. Yeah, for sure. For so. sure. <laughs> But yeah, it was uh, like, so for that one, um, the main, one of the things I really love was the zombies. Like how, what, what was the thought process? Like, cause their faces morph so much. Well, you know, when Andy brought the script to me, it was much more, do you remember the, the, the show that Del Toro did? I think it was called the strain. Yes. It was like a lot of tentacles and vampire type of shit. And, and Andy's original script um, it was a little bit more like that. A lot of tentacles, less zombies. Andy's original script, it was like an infestation, which we kind of didn't want to do because of COVID. And then it was like people with tentacles shooting out of their mouths. Then there was a giant tentacle monster. Then there was like a giant 10 foot spider monster. Then there was the big monster at the end. And I was like, Andy, we just, we just can't do this. We just don't have, we don't have $20 million like Krampus. We have like, we have like three, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I said to Andy, I was like, Andy, I, I think it would be cool if instead of just like straight up infected people, we leaned into the consumerism and like, I drew this like purple and orange skin with like a black beak. And it was like a vulture person. And we, we ultimately didn't end up, exactly there and i i kind of wish we did but you know bob kurtzman also is incredibly talented and had his own ideas um and, you know bob just didn't want to lean too much into like the sci-fi aspect of it and I, I totally get that uh but you know when we have the old grandmother chasing uh devin slash ken around the store we got into that sort of vulture kind of harpy bird type of thing so we just didn't want to go traditional zombies. I think that that more consumerism day of the dead thing has, has been done and, you know, been there, done that. So we wanted something, you know, I said, Andy vultures are scary and they're fast. And, and uh, he was like, you know, Andy was great about like, you know, being down to change things. Some writers aren't like that, you know? Um, so it was like a collaborative type of thing. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cause like the, yeah. the old, uh, the old lady zombie was definitely like, one of the creepiest yeah it, she like, was great. visually striking yeah absolutely and so <clears throat> as far as like working with like devin sawa michael jai white bruce bruce campbell like i've heard a bruce campbell interview and he's sounds really cool like what is it like working with bruce campbell i mean you know bruce is one of those guys when when we initially had his name on the list i was like i heard bruce was difficult to work with and then i realized that you know a dear friend of mine from boston used to be the showrunner head writer on ash versus evil dead so i texted him and i was like his name's craig d gregorio i was like craig what's the deal with campbell he was like bruce is the greatest dude on earth the greatest and i was like okay well he's hired you know and then he <laughs> and i had our first initial conversation uh and he was like mr tebow he's like i watched happy birthday i really enjoyed it he's like let's this will be fun he goes i'm not gonna play ash i want to play against type and i was like i get it and he was just incredible and the thing about bruce one thing that was frustrating for me is i went from happy birthday where you're like doing everything yourself and you're moving things around and you're moving lights and you're helping everybody because it's a small six hundred thousand dollar non-union movie and then you go to Black Friday and it's a couple million bucks and you have a union movie and it's like a light bulb goes out and I go to change a light bulb and like, you know, the the production designer and the set decorator are screaming at me to not touch the light bulb because you can't do that. <laughs> you can't you can't do that. Someone that's somebody's job. You know, and I would see Bruce getting frustrated because this is a guy who came from 
the indie film world and he's done a bunch of B movies and indie movies. So it's like, you know, if, if someone needs to move a chair, Bruce will fucking do it. He'll just move a chair and he doesn't give a shit what anybody says. And I could see him getting a little bit frustrated with some of the kind of lollygag and bullshit by the union crew where they just took their time. And, and I could see Bruce getting frustrated as I was too. Uh, but he was just so great and so great on the spot and such a pro and he was always willing to come out of his trailer to do lines off camera with the other actors, which he didn't have to, you know, but he was great. He was great. That's yeah. You kind of answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which was he almost feels like the anti Ash where he's very fatherly and he's in the background, not the guy in the foreground and the fighter. And then he has his like moment at the end where he kind of flips, which is yeah. cool. Yeah. We it's funny, Bruce and I actually changed that because Andy's original script, Jonathan was just a prick the entire movie and then he died like this horrible death. And I was like, Andy, we got Bruce Campbell. We need to like give his character more of an arc. And Andy was like, No, that's great. And Bruce and I actually rewrote a lot of his speeches at the end. And um, you know, I think one of the things that sort of aggravates me for Bruce and I don't need to defend him at all is I think you, you people can see how great he was when he did things like Bubba Hotep. And when he did that TV show on USA uh, burn notice, it's like everybody thinks him of his ash. He's ash. He's ash. But I think the fact that he played this sort of, you know, doofus lifelong company man with this fucking V neck sweater and a mustache that just goes to show you what a great actor Bruce is, you know, and there was a lot of evil dead fans that were pissed that he didn't play Ash. And Bruce was, it was so funny. We did a, we did Adam green and Joe Lynch's Yorkie thon last year. And Bruce was like, fuck those people. You know what I mean? Like it was just so great <laughs> to have, to have his support, you know? Yeah. So he was amazing. They all so were. Devin, I have Devin, to ask. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Oh yeah. Go, no, go ahead. You were, you were kind of headed in a direction I was going to go anyway. So no, go for it. Um, oh yeah. So the, the structure they build, um, we couldn't help but notice that it looks like a big pink penis. <laughs> is that, is that the direction it was going? No, it's so funny. You know, you do things when you make a movie and sometimes you have regrets. When Andy and I were first constructing the main creature, we literally had just a giant, like, stay puff size fucking soccer mom. It was straight up like a lady with a ponytail with just, like, red skin. And we were going to call her Karen Kong. But we just thought it was, like, too on the nose. And it's so funny. James Janice did his uh, Dead Meat broadcast. And he was like, I don't understand why these guys just didn't do Karen Kong. And it's like, oh, man, maybe we should have. No, there was no phallic. That was Bob Kurtzman and his team just kind of went away. And I said, I just want a big mass of people and this thing to have, like, teeth all over it. And, like, one head should be like a vulture and one head should be like a human and uh, that was a guy in a suit up against the green screen. So it's all practical effects. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, which the like the the zombies like the, the was it like a <clears throat> intentional choice to make them more like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More, more conscious and more like planning because they came off a lot like that. What you mean, like planning to build this thing at the end? Well, yeah, because like normally it's like you see these zombies movies and it's just like a, a zombie that, you know, like plods along and eats flesh. And like and in this one, they're they're moving things around to create something. Well, I think, I, you know, I, I don't want to misquote anything and I don't want to discredit Andy. And I, I, I don't remember. I do know that his ending always was the same. The ending always was this giant mass of shoppers coming together. But I think that we kind of pulled an audible a couple weeks before production. And I said, Andy, I think we need to have them like building this sort of hive uh, in the middle of the store to, to sort of protect this creature. I could be wrong. That could have been Andy's idea. I, I don't remember. But I know that we as a team sort of thought like, man, it would be cool if they were like stacking toys and making this area in Santa's village. 
Um, so it's probably a little bit of both. Yeah. And, um, uh, one of the characters that, uh, like we kind of like, like kind of connected to, and that was really hilarious was, was Brian. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> He's just comes off so sassy, so snarky. Uh, just, just the, the ideal or the personification of the manager that you don't want to deal with. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's Brian is 100% Andy's creation. I mean, that is Andy's writing. Brian, Brian did not really change at all. Uh, the only thing I think that Brian, uh, you know, Stephen Peck had never done a movie, had never, he, he'd done a couple commercials. And I don't, I also don't want to misgender Stephen because I, I know uh, they're non binary. So if I say he, I, it's just because my brain is, yeah, stop talking about Brian, uh, but St- but I, Stephen knows that, and they don't get mad about it. Um, but you know, we had all these auditions, and there was this one really great guy. I forget his name. Uh, he was incredible, and he was much more of a kind of Jason Bateman uptight dick. Uh, and then there was actually another. There was a girl who was on a big Netflix show. This Latina girl, she was also incredible. We we're going to call her Brianna. And it was like them in between the two of them. And then the casting director, Brandon, was like, well, here's another bunch of auditions. And then Steven just to me, I watched their audition and I went, holy shit, who is this person? It, he, they just had this like Rebel Wilson quality where they're going to steal the movie. And in the process of filming, Devin Sawa and Bruce Campbell pulled me aside and were like, this this kid is like stealing the movie. And he's never done a feature. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. <clears throat> but um, are there uh, any plans for a Black Friday sequel? Because it seemed like it had a pretty wide open ending. Um, I mean, that's really always up to the distributor. You know, it's like they own the rights to the movie now, Screen Media. And it's like, I know that, you know, it did pretty well last year. And oh, I know no that way. this year on Black Friday and Thanksgiving, we were getting huge reactions on social media so i can i could I mean maybe i i don't know it all it's it always comes down to money you know yeah yep yeah so and uh as far as any uh like upcoming projects you can talk about i mean as much as you can talk about them or is there anything yeah i have um there's a couple that i was approached to do this really cool slasher uh, I can't really talk much about it for the sake of the writer's privacy. It was a number one on the blacklist. Uh, and I found it and just emailed the writer and was like, holy shit, the script is amazing. And they were like, oh, my God, would you direct it? And I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting you to, to ask me that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's that. And then there's another script uh, that I wrote with my buddy Clay McCormick, who uh, writes comic books for DC. I think right now he's writing Nightwing or Batman or one version of those characters. He and I wrote a really great dark little sort of new England thriller mixed with fantasy. It's, it's about two brothers whose uh, their dad passes away and leaves them all this stuff. And they find this puzzle box, which is like a treasure map. And when they go to, to the treasure map, they discover this really old, like narwhal with this tusk, that supposedly possesses magic properties and then just shit goes fucking horribly wrong after that. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, it's really cool. And then, like I said, I have this, this other one, this cop movie gut shot that uh, Redbox wanted to do, but a lot of it's about timing and what actors are available. And, you know, it's like uh, if I go to do the Narwhal movie in the spring and John Malkovich is available and I can get him to play the father, then the movie gets financed. So it's, it's, it's just a game of cat and mouse, you know? Yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. That, but yeah, we, um, like I said previously, we like, I I really enjoyed both of your movies. We really enjoyed black Friday. And I mean, we're definitely going to be keeping up with, you know, all your other movies. Cause amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, thank you for being here and, uh, man, I, I really appreciate it. And, um, we'll, uh, we definitely like to talk to you again, uh, after happy birthday or even have you on the episode if you wanted to be. Yeah, you got it. Anything. I'm always down to chat.
All right. Um, Thank you for listening to the podcast. We are available on Apple, Google, Stitcher, and Spotify. Give us a like and subscribe if you like what you hear. Thank you.